We're in Kailua and we're going to the chocolate factory. The wife got some Groupon and uh, we're gonna go and check this place out. So, welcome to Kailua. Today is the 14th of March, 2020. Dun dun dun. It's a cloudy day. It's all right, can you see it in the background? Just wait for the wife to show up. Let's do it. Yep, that's me. Okay. I work here. Okay. Okay, you're good. So I'm just going to check you in and we'll start at Tiffany. Uh, more involved in the industry than you think. So we're going to learn all about that. Uh, we're going to review a range of topics. We've divided the tour into kind of a three part uh, approach. The beginning, or the, for the next 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes or so, we're going to be up here. Um, I'm going to give you kind of a big picture review of what the chocolate industry looks like in the world at large. Um, we're going to talk about the difference between craft chocolate and commodity chocolate. I'm going to give you a, a bit of small business history of the play with. Um, we've only been in business for about 10 years, so we're still very much a growing uh, industry here, a growing business here. We are a local Hawaiian bean to bar craft chocolate maker. We source cocoa beans from farms all around the world. We take those cocoa beans and then we craft them into gourmet chocolates. Uh, what makes this operation really special and really unique is that Hawaii is the only state in the U.S. that has the proper climate to grow the cacao tree. A uh, little bit, uh, a few random trees are, are fruiting um, in the southern kind of tip of Florida, um, but it cannot grow commercially there. It's not, it hasn't been very successful. So we are the only state in the U.S. that could participate, not just on the making side of things, but in the growing process as well. So the fact that Hawaii, Hawaii is the only state in the U.S. that can grow the cacao tree really speaks to how this business came to be in the first place. So I want to rewind time back to 2010 uh, when this company was established. We founded this business back in 2010. We're coming up on our 10 year anniversary. Uh, this, this company is actually started by a husband and wife couple um, named Tammy and Dylan. Uh, I referenced their names a handful of times throughout the tour, um, so don't act too surprised. But basically they were inspired to build a chocolate factory in Hawaii upon learning that Hawaii was the only state in the U.S. that could grow it. But all of the local farmers that were growing cacao at the time were sending their cocoa beans to the mainland to be turned into chocolate. It became, became blaringly obvious to the founders that we need a chocolate factory in the state of Hawaii to partner with local farms and help develop the industry here. So you guys, a lot of lo you guys are all local. So this will, this is, I'm, I'm happy to bring this up because a lot of people ask this question: Why Manoa Chocolate in Kailua? <laughs> I live in Manoa Valley. I'm like constantly in Manoa, right? Leave Manoa Valley to go to Manoa Chocolate back then. But the meaning of the word Manoa in Hawaiian language means vast, deep, complex. Um, th these are the things that not only did we want the chocolate to be but also in reference to the scope of this business, far reaching, not just that kind of corner store chocolate operation, but developing the industry here, planting trees, giving back to the community. Um, there's so many things that kind of plug back into making delicious chocolate. All right, the next clip that's coming up, I took a picture in picture of some video on the left hand side you're gonna see the old way that they used to grind up the little nibs 
from the cocoa pods. And then on the right side of the screen, you're gonna see what they use now of a actual machine to grind up the nibs. And then they have hanging up on the wall, dedicated to the old way that they used to grind up nibs. So enjoy this next clip. All right, so that's what we're going for inside. Okay, we okay. don't want the shell. Okay. And we have a back massager here underneath a piece of stainless steel, and it's going to vibrate the beans down at a constant flow. And as Megan rides the bicycle, it's going to crack the beans. <laughs> cool. Um, what we're going to do now is we're metaphorically leaving the farms, right? We're leaving that gallery wall over there, we're leaving the farms, and what we're now doing is we're going to insert ourselves into the shoes of the chocolate maker. So on the other side of the world, um, we're now looking at this whole process through the lens of the maker and what their set of priorities are um, and how to make chocolate. So, number one thing, it doesn't make, I just like, really kind of berated the point that the farming process is so important. You guys, as a maker, it makes no difference whatsoever if there are really amazing growers out there, if we don't have relationships with them, right? We need to develop those relationships. We need to, we need to work with the best farmers in the world in order to make the best chocolate. So you guys, I'm sure, have all heard of fair trade and like USDA, organic certified, that kind of thing. We do work with all organic farms. Um, and although fair trade is fantastic for um, you know keeping that conversation alive, it's been really good for promoting conscious consumerism. People are more aware of where their food is coming from because of fair trade. Uh, but we work on a different system. We actually work several ladder points above fair trade in terms of um, the farmers getting paid well. We work on a direct trade system. So we pay the highest prices in the industry for the highest quality beans. So a lot of times when I tell people that, they're like, okay, like you just did, you just talked about all the small business history and all the hurdles that you had to overcome. How is it that a small maker in Kailua Town, Oahu can afford the, the most expensive cocoa beans? Well, that's the beauty of direct trade. Given the world that we're living in, we have our iPhones and our smartphones. We can use various applications to contact our guy all the way on the other side of the world um, and place orders directly. Again, we pay a, an absolute premium for um, very high quality cocoa beans. So, with that in mind, we do have relationships with farms all over the world. And seeing as we're you know, striving to make the best chocolate in the world, we frequently go to chocolate award ceremonies, which allows us to network further with other farmers wanting to, to sell their cacao. Um, I'm going to pass around a few different sample jars. Um, and again, this is, this is the kind of thing that the chocolate maker would do. We would get a small batch, we would analyze those beans, we would do a small batch of chocolate, and we would assess whether or not we want to invest and work with them in the future, whether we think it's good enough to make a 70% dark chocolate bar, or if it maybe isn't quite there yet. So, what we want to do, just like going to a wine tasting, uh, that again, who's been to a wine tasting? Okay, so a lot of this, <laughs> so a lot of this is going to sound very familiar. When you're at a wine tasting, the small hand will pour you just a little drop of wine, and they want you to look at it, they want you to swish it around, they want you to smell it. Um, they want you to do like a hundred different things before you actually take a sip of wine, which can sometimes be very irritating, but it's what you gotta do. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pass around this jar of um, a few jars of beans. I want you to take notice of the size, the color, and the size. So those nibs, I mean, I keep joking, but, but those nibs are your chocolate multivitamins. They're extremely good for you. They have more potassium than any other plant in nature, um, more so than bananas. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's chocolate. That's what chocolate's made of. Um, but they're, those nibs are super good for you. They're high in potassium, magnesium, iron. They help facilitate weight loss. Um, the element that I keep talking about, that theobromine, is a natural antidepressant. Makes people feel really good and happy. Um, it's also an appetite suppressant. It makes I don't know if you guys have had this experience, but if you if you have dinner and go for like a Snickers after dinner, what do you want to do after you have a Snickers bar? 
I don't need to go on here, but after you have a Snickers bar, I want to have another Snickers bar, like like immediately. Like I want, I can just keep eating the Snickers, right? Um, but in the case of dark chocolate, just one little morsel will completely satisfy that craving, and you actually don't go end up going back for more. So, anyway. Um, we've got our stone grinders in the front, which is what he's working on. Those are a more are a more classic way of grinding down cacao. It's more European. Basically, that outer drum is spinning one direction, whereas inside are two very very heavy stone wheels um, grinding the opposite direction. So those work. Um, those do about 20 kilograms of cocoa in four days and four nights. Um, Grinding consistently. The, the chocolate makers like to joke that those are the real hard workers. They can load those up, go surfing for four days, and then come back and they're pretty much ready to be molded. Um, I also want to draw your eye to the ball mills directly back. We've got one for milk chocolate and one for dark. Um, never any cross contamination. That's just a separate way of grinding down the cacao. Uh, I want to be clear the cocoa goes into one or the other, not here and then here. The ball mills function in an entirely different way. They, take, they use about 80,000 heavy steel balls. Um, you can see that lower photo there is what the inside of those look like. Those steel balls are jumping around like popcorn, kind of gyrating amongst each other, grinding up that cacao. So like I said, those nibs, 50% cocoa butter, 50% cocoa powder, um, they will naturally liquefy. We do add a little bit of additional cocoa butter, like what he was doing there, to make it extra velvety and smooth. But beyond that, we're never going to use additives like soy or palm or wax or that whole list of ingredients. Okay, so that was the Manoa Chocolate Factory. It was a great place. It was very cheap to get inside. And uh, we learned uh, all about chocolate. And you know, it was really good. It was handcrafted chocolate as opposed to corporate chocolate like Hershey's. Not very good. So if you ever come out to visit us here in Hawaii or if you are out here on your own, it doesn't take very long to get to the other side of the island and look up Manoa Chocolate Factory and get a part of their tour. It's a great tour. A lot of people, uh, you know, go there. Yeah, the chocolate is expensive, but you know, it's handcrafted and it's really good. And now, you know, it's all about going out there and visiting small businesses and, um, you know, helping them out, especially now during this coronavirus stuff, you know. It's always nice to go out there and support the local business. And I'm always about supporting the local business. So, you know, have fun, kids, and uh, be like me. Have fun, right? And, uh, you know, you never know. Oh, by the way, before I go, yeah, this is not my real hair. Thank you very much. You know, it's time. Remember, kids, have fun. Be safe. And hopefully we'll see you next time. And if you're new to this channel, click down below and subscribe. Leave some comments. Maybe uh, you can suggest uh, something for me to do on this island. I know it's kind of crazy now, but, you know, what else do you want to see? Do you want to see YKK Beach? Do you want to see, you know, the North Shore? Let me know. We got nothing but time now, right? So, until next time, kids, be safe. As always, peace out.